Hello there, loves. A good, pleasant day to you. I, uh, we are here with another tier list because I have a problem. I like these. They're fun. They, I don't know why. It's a fun way to interact with the arms community and scene without having to necessarily play as much arms. Tier list addiction. I, I mean, the biggest reason why, obviously. Well, maybe not obviously. Here, we're just gonna open this up. The biggest reason why is because, well, I can't really go on ranked and do too many interesting things half the time. I'm gonna go grab my water. Ah, that's better. So yeah, uh, the main reason why I've been doing a lot of tier lists lately is there's not too much, well, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on in ARMS. We've got lots of tournaments, we've got lots of events. Friendlies are always around. But the main way just to kind of pick up and play ARMS, uh, ranked, at least for me, is not necessarily accessible at the hours I generally want it to be. So I don't really have that option. So what better way to fill in that void than with more tier lists? This one's a big one. This one might take two hours. I'd like to make a formal announcement that this tier list is going to take the entire day because that's a lot of things. I guess... There's no better way to approach this mess of a tier list than to, I guess, I don't know, dive in? Who's ready to swim in some arms for a little bit? So what we have here today is all of the arms in the game. Not the characters, the arms. Yes, that is correct. We are going to be making an arms, arms tier list. Why am I so proud of that joke? It's not even a joke. It's just like, it's just the a game arms and the things in them are called arms. Why do I find that funny? I can actually think about that. Maybe I'll think about that later. Anyways, confusion and Anxiety aside, uh, we've got all of the arms in the game. Uh, you can see them right here. Everything from a Biffler to a Whammer. Covering all types of elements, types, ground, weights, speeds. I've dealt with them all enough that I've seen their updates, their changes. While I'm probably not in the grand scheme the best person to make a tier list, the best person would be a community of people, as has happened before. But... It's fun sharing my opinion. And right now, they're the, some of the most popular videos I have on YouTube, so I'm gonna do more of them. Before I fully start, I would like to thank Zon Supremes, for making these, setting these tier lists up, he did it quite some time ago. I I contacted him, asked him for links to this tier list specifically, and he had it ready and just available for me to start playing with. So shout out to Zon, cool person, cool. Was an admin for Arm Central. Now he just kind of chills there and does cool things. Definitely, definitely send him hugs. Without further to do, without further ado, let's 
to start off with the tier list with our first arms on here. Now this, I don't think it's in any particular order. <clears throat> Cause technically it should start with the glove. Toaster specifically from Springman. I know the lists. This is really out of order. It's okay. We don't need to worry about order here. Life is just chaos. Mm. So our first... Oh, it's... It's alphabetical! Biffler, B-I, then Bloor, Boomerang, Birchhug, Bub, Buff... Oh, okay. Now... Actually, here, yeah, let's let's start with it this way. So, before we fully and properly start up this tier list, we should probably discuss the elements. Now, each of these arms have some kind of element or a bonus that coincides with the lack of element. I can probably make a tier list for that, too. We'll likely see that in the future. But for now, we'll just cover the basics of what each element is and what it does. Fire is going to be our first element for discussion. Uh, that element is... Fire. It makes your glove flaming, which guarantees that it's going to do... Instant knockdown when it's charged. Immediately knocking your opponent down generally does a high amount of damage on impact. Uh, and it's also going to reduce your opponent's charge when it connects. Fire is a very popular element in the scene today and is used very often. The second element that we have is the shock element. Now, this one and the next element, the term terminology for these two can get mixed up a little bit. Because a lot of people will just call both of them stuns. Which, arguably, they both are. In this case, I'm just going to call it... We'll, we'll just go with the Pokemon terminology here. And... Oh, wait. What's it? Oh, I got it. No. So, Electric's going to be stunned. Okay, here, start it. Moving back to... We'll just cut out this entire part. Okay, so... Electric has the stun element. And what the stun element does is it disables your opponent's arms, much like if you attacked both of their arms down and broke them, and forces them to be vulnerable for a set period of time. This varies on each arm, so... When we talk about each arm, we will be rating each one based on how long it holds that stun as well. But this generally allows for combo opportunities. It's one of the few setups that you can do to get those combos. The next arm in our list also generally does get mixed up with the, the stun arm, electric type. Because it's also arguably a stun. Uh, we're going to call it flinch here, though, just to have some kind of difference here. And that's the one with the little gear thing. Uh, the impact arms, the flinch arms, when they land, they cause the opponent to flinch. And what that means is that the recoil time for them, once they get hit, is doubled, extended greatly. Generally, it just takes them a lot longer to be able to react after they get flinched. This is a set number for each and every arm. Uh, certain ones retract a little bit slower though, so some don't offer as many combos. But a lot of them are pretty effective in most cases, especially in very aggressive play. The next element we're going to be covering is the no element. Now, the no element doesn't have any of the, the, those abilities. It doesn't burst with flame, it doesn't stun, it doesn't flinch, it doesn't explode. It's just a standard arm. When it gets charged, it doesn't do anything special in terms of those elements, but what it does in exchange is either 
increases the size of the arm when it's charged or increases the damage it does exponentially. One of the strongest arms in the game is a non-element. There is an element arm that also does an equivalent amount of damage, but those are about the two strongest in the game. Then that would be the roaster and the megaton. We're not gonna count explosive arms on that list as I'm just talking about in a single hit. So generally these non-element arms, they make up for the fact that they don't have a special element by having an inherent new property to them that will help them out in the battlefield. So those ones are very case by case. The next element we, that we have is the blast element. Now this one is very popular amongst the scene as what happens with it is after a charged blast arm connects, it causes a splash AOE attack that covers a wide range around wherever it blew up and it goes through deflects. So this is an effective tool for counseling out a deflect user for interrupting somebody who might be trying to approach you and might be using their shield as it's going to push them back a lot. It's pretty effective at canceling out rushes or catching opponents in the air. Generally, explosive arms are pretty effective. They do have one caveat though. An arm that is an explosive element does also carry the property that while it is charged, when your arm gets damaged, it inflicts damage to you. So it actually blows you up, leaves you stunned, which means that there's a lot of opportunity for opponents to punish that with a combo or just stacking damage on you. The next element we're going to be covering up it or covering we're not covering them up we're revealing them if anything the next element we're going to be talking about is the poison element now the poison element there's only three of them in the game they're all pretty difficult arms to use in some manner what the poison element does in arms is it's going to when it hits your opponent, it poisons them. And what a poison does in this game is it does a single point of damage for about 12 ticks. I don't have the specific time for how long in between each tick, but generally you're getting... I believe it's every half a second you get a tick. Now, so... If you land poison once, that's 12 damage that you're going to get over the next 6 seconds. But, if while those sec 6 seconds are happening, uh, you have the opportunity to hit your opponent again with the charged arm, that poison will stack. And that means that it's going to do 24 damage over 6 seconds now. And if you hit one more time, that's going to be 3 that's going to be 36 damage that you're going to deal over 6 seconds. Now, that's about as high as it can go. You can reset the stack from there, continually making sure that you do have 3 stacks on them. And this is a lot easier the more stacks you have, as poison also has a stutter to it. So every time the poison deals a tick of damage, the opponent the one who is poisoned stutters and what a stutter basically does is I don't know the specific details but I'd probably say it it's one frame of pause every tick on two stacks it's two stacks it's probably two frames of pause every tick and on three stacks it's three frames of pause every tick now these aren't the official numbers this is speculation on my part but that's probably about where we're going with Uh, let's see. There's two more elements that we have left to cover. No, four. Three? We have more to cover. The next element we're going to be covering is the wind element. Now, I personally find this to be one of the most effective elements in this game, as it generally has a pretty high damage output. Uh, 
Mm. And when the wind proper... Oh, sorry. When the wind element connects with the opponent, the opponent immediately gets swept up in the air. Now, they're going to be in up in the air for about one, one and a half seconds. And within this time, uh, you actually have the opportunity to do a lot of things. Depending on your character, you might be in a position where you can charge a dragon arm, get an EMP, buff up. You can also use that time to juggle your opponent as while well. they're in the air. If you hit them again, that's going to be another 20 damage. So in a lot of cases, the Wind Element Arms have a very accessible opportunity to do 20 more damage than they already do, consistently. The Wind Element also contributes to an opportunity known as the Wind Yabuki. Now what the Wind Yabuki does is it's very similar to the Yabuki in the fact that your opponent is exposed for a very long time and they're not able to protect themselves. So you just have a very safe opportunity to throw out a rush, have it connect, and deal a lot of additional damage. Our next element we are going to be covering will be the ice element. Now, the ice element, when it hits your opponent, it freezes them for about, I don't know, three, five seconds. Yeah, we'll say about somewhere around there. It's a consistent time, so it doesn't matter which arm you hit with it. It could be an Ice Dragon, it could be a Cool Rain, it could be a Chilla. They're all going to freeze for the exact same period of time. But that's still a lot of time where your character, while they aren't stunned, they do have, they are unable to move around freely. And you're not capable of charging your arms. So all that's left are uncharged arms that move a little bit slower than their charged counterparts. Or uncharged arms that are a little bit slower than their unfrozen counterparts. And your shield. That's about all you can really do. So this gives the opponent some strong opportunities to get some reads, counters, grabs. Uh... Ice arms are very well known for being the best combo arm in the game, as, well, they're the most riskiest. You can get some really good combos with them, taking a lot of players from full to critical health or even a KO before they can even find a way out of your ice chain. But if an opponent does get a couple, one or two good reads against you, uh, ice element is consistently less effective than a stun arm. So it's all about mind games and learning to read your opponent with it. You Every time you hit with a freeze arm, it resets the freeze. There is also a light flinch element to the freeze arms when an opponent is freezing, frozen, where if you do hit them again, it will take them a little bit longer to get back into a position where they can continue punching and shielding than if they weren't frozen. So you can also take advantage of that. The final element that we have here... Yeah, this is the final one. Is the blind element. Now, this one isn't seen very often in the competitive scene. Used specifically for that blind element. Generally, the arm that is most used of those two arms, it's just used because it's a really good arm. And what the poison element does is when it hits an opponent, it blinds them. Depending on the type of arm, the blind is different. Uh, but generally, the main goal of a blind arm is it obstructs the screen. This can work somewhat similarly to ice the ice element, where while they have free mobility and the options that are available to them, uh, they, with a couple of good reads, they'll probably be able to get out relatively safely unharmed. But there's always the opportunity for you to, if you blind them, get a good read on them as they quickly 
panic to try to respond to the fact that they can't see much of anything anymore. And then you might be able to get a couple of good chains off of it. It is important to keep in mind, with the ice and stun element arms, your opponent still has access to rush. And if they do have it available and choose to use it, it will remove the freeze or blind effect, allowing them full control of their character. They will also be fully ready to punish or attack you. So you'll want to be careful of that. With about, what was that, 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, we kind of... This, this video is already going to take up forever. With the elements all covered up, and everybody hopefully on base with how these elements kind of work, let's move over to the arms. So, what we're going to be starting with is the Biffler. Now, this is the blind element arm that I was just talking about, where when it impacts the opponent, uh, it leaves these giant Biffler ink marks, about three of them randomly placed on the screen, generally around the middle, prevents the opponent from being able to see effectively, and gives them a hard time. Now, that's not actually the strongest thing about the Biffler. The Biffler is one of the fastest arms in the game, extending very quickly and reaching your opponent and recovering at a rather solid speed. Not the f It doesn't recover as quickly as a lot of other arms out there, but it recovers pretty quickly and allows it to be a very safe tool. Biffler has three projectiles, one shot uncharged, that can cover a lot of opponent's ground that's going to be a lot more difficult for them to punch it down, which means that more often than not, if you're just blasting them down with uncharged Bifflers, you're probably going to hit them. The Biffler is very much a tower in how it approaches though, so if your opponent moves over to here or here, the Biffler is going to have a little bit harder of a time reaching them. Now, one of the caveats to the Biffler is the fact that when it's charged, the Biffler becomes a single entity. So uncharged, it's three shots, you knock down one, it's still got two coming at you. When charged, if you knock down this one, these two come down. I should probably be easier to see like this. And that's also the case with when it's in rush. To quickly cover what happens in rush, uh, all for our, all arms, they generally have different attributes, flurry, burst, so on and so forth. Uh, but every arm, when the rush is used, increases the weight by one. So light arm will be able to box with a medium arm, so on and so forth. So that means that the single entity Rush Biffler can get punched down by a toaster. And if that happens, you're probably going to be left very vulnerable as the Biffler's r Rush has a decent amount of time to recovery, which means that your opponent is either going to be safe to shield or they're just going to punch you down. Coupled with a... It does have an extremely fast rush though. So if your opponent is not prepared to counter it, there's a good chance you're going to throw it out and it, if it does connect, it's going to do some decent damage. Overall, uh, Biffler is one of the strongest arms in the game, though I would say it does have a couple of weaknesses. So we're just going to put it over an A tier. It's a consistent arm. When, we can, when we're placing an arm on the tier list, there's a lot that's going to be going into it, but the grand scheme of things is how versatile is the arm, how well can it be used by all characters, what can it do in a, in a void. Overall, the Biffler can work well on pretty equipped by pretty much any character. Uh, it's got some really good capabilities. Generally, if you choose to put this on your loadout, you're probably going to have a pretty effective loadout against a lot of opponents. It can even at times work against heavies if you approach with it properly. That is not necessarily the case though with this next or oh, arm. The Blor is our other poison element, or no. It's our other blind element in this game. So while the Biffler leaves the Biffle Marks, uh, Blorb just leaves a giant 
blush in the middle of the screen. Preventing your opponent from being able to see generally and just making it a lot harder for them to play. The Blorb is a heavyweight arm, which means it's going to outbox most of the other arms in this game. But it also has the unique property, in which case, when it attacks, it goes in these bounces. So it kind of makes a bit of a wave and then just bounces out until it stops. This allows it to be a pretty effective... This allows it to be a pretty effective counter to a lot of aerial play. But at the same time, it does allow certain characters to just kind of slip right underneath it and punish it. It can be pretty vulnerable. Overall though, it also ha is a pretty effective arm. It's got some good capabilities to it. And when you throw out the grab, it also, unlike every other arm, changes the properties of the grab. So when you throw out a grab, most of them go out like this. The blorb, it, it continues that wave motion. The wave motion. When you throw out a grab. So that can make your grabs a lot more difficult to avoid. It makes you a lot easier to catch characters that are above you with a grab. Blorb overall can be very effective in those situations. But it does have the danger of if you miss with the Blorb, it's probably going to be just kind of bouncing aimlessly in some random direction. And it will leave you pretty vulnerable. So overall, this arm works pretty well on a lot of characters. It's pretty, it's not too complicated to use. But it, well, it's, it's not extremely complicated, but it is a little unwieldy and it will take some time to get good with it. It's not a bad arm. But the reason why it's not seen very often is that it's just, there are better options. Consistently, when you look at overall on the tier, when we look at the tier list as it further develops, as we get to future arms, you'll see there's a lot of cases where it does a lot of great things, but you can look at any single aspect of what the blurb is and say, that's why I pick it. And somebody will be able to go, if that's what you're looking for, this is a better arm for that. So that's what makes it not a great arm. While it is consistent-ish and can kind of work pretty well, we're going to start by putting in the D tier. Mostly because, as I just said, it's going to be, it's a good pick if you want to go for it, but in most cases you're probably better off picking a different tool. Our next arm that we're going to be covering up for this event, or this list, <clears throat> is the Boomerang. Now, the Boomerang has the wind element and it's a curve arm. Weight, medium. So what that means is, when the Boomerang is shot out, it's going to move around like this, or like this. One of these two ways, it can kind of soften the way it curves. But it's never going to go like this. It's always kind of swinging in this way and trying to catch them. So, though, that's generally how it kind of moves. It's one of the faster curve arms. It's a pretty solid tool for catching a lot of opponents, especially if they're throwing out a lot of straightforward punches. Or if they have a heavyweight arm, it will generally pretty effectively stop those. It'll just get around them and those, the opponent will just struggle a lot more. All right, <clears throat> so Boomerang has these nice curves. Uh, it's good for getting around a lot of the heavy arms and a lot of gloves. It's actually a pretty popular pick for players countering that. The Boomerang has the wind property and when you throw out its rush, it's actually a very solid anti-air as it makes a bit of a wavy pattern to try to catch opponents. And it also is a tornado that's pretty tall. So it will cover anybody on the ground, anybody who tries to jump above it. They will likely get catch, caught. And they won't be able to get out of it. It allows for 
a lot of time for you to set up these big combos, equip yourself with a proper loadout, or t or equip yourself with a proper stance, like Dragon Arm, so on and so forth. It's not too great at boxing, as Curve Arms are generally a little bit slower when it comes to recovering, but overall, it's a pretty consistent arm. The Boomerang works pretty well on most characters. It's a very accessible arm. It's... Probably one of the easiest curve arms to learn in this game, and the wind element gives it a huge boon, making it one of the strongest. <clears throat> so, I'm gonna personally put this one... It's not an S tier. It can't... It, while it is a very powerful tool, it's... We're gonna save S tier for the things where I'm like, you're gonna have s it's just really easy and useful to use. It is very rewarding to have a boomerang, it's very approachable, it's very powerful. Uh, you could effectively equip double boomerang and just be a very terrifying opponent. We're gonna leave it on A tier. The next arm on this list, the Burchuck, is a part of the Chuck family. And this arm is a little complicated to use. It has two different properties to how it acts. It's got its grounded form and it's got its aerial form. And now the difference between the two is that the grounded form is just a wall. If you throw it out, it's just a giant spinning wall that will, you can kind of throw out at your opponent. If you throw it while you're in the air, it will, rather than approach like this, it will approach like this, which means it's gonna curve a little bit more. It generally moves a little bit more quickly and it makes it a little bit more effective at catching a lot of opponents. When you throw it out in rush, it does a lot of shield pressure damage, which allows it to be one of the shield breaker arms allowing you to have potential combos to follow up after you've broken their shield, or if you're just wanting to approach in a way that deals an immense amount of damage and eats through their shield regardless. Overall, Burchuck is a pretty solid arm. It does have the ice element to it. Unfortunately, due to its slower speed, it struggles to allow players to effectively utilize the ice chains that you would possibly be able to have. Generally, what you're going to want only be able to do with ice chains off of the bird chuck are grabs. Beyond that, it's just good for catch knocking opponents out of the air. Or countering light arms. As it is a medium arm, it will outweigh those tools. I should have grabbed lemon water or tea. No. Oh. So, overall, it's a pretty solid arm. It does have a lot of trickiness to it. And it's easy to fall into very basic habits with it. A lot of people are very well known of players picking something like Master Mummy and just kind of walking up to you and throwing double bird chuck. It's pretty effective in those ways, but it also has a lot of weaknesses and can get hard countered pretty heavily by pretty much any heavy arm or just solid movement on most characters. Some will struggle with it more, but overall it's probably not gonna be the strongest tool in your belt and you're probably not gonna see it too often beyond those cheese strats. We'll put it in C tier because it does have effectiveness. It works well on a lot of characters, but once again, it's there's just better options out there in most cases. You're probably going to be better off picking a different tool. Our next arm, though, is definitely something that actually does see a, de a bit of play here and there in the arm scene. We've got ourselves the Bub. Now, the Bub is for the boxing extraordinaire. It doesn't have the highest speed. It doesn't have too great of a damage output. It's pretty consistent. 
but it recovers extremely quickly. As soon as it's made in impact with something or it's made its max distance, it's within a few mom within the blink of an eye, it's already back in your possession and ready to be used again. This can make it a very safe tool that can be very difficult for an opponent to kind of punch through, punch around. Especially coupled with the fact that while it is unelemented, when it is charged, it becomes larger. So normally it's like this. When it's charged, it's like this. That allows you just to kind of wall people out. Because of the way it's designed as well, you're going to be throwing it out a lot. You're going to be building up a lot of charge, which means that you'll probably get a lot of rushes off of it. Overall, this is probably one of the more player-friendly arms in the game. It, would, it doesn't have too much homing to it. It is very much the opposite of the next arm that we're going to be talking about. Just in that regard, but if you're just looking for a straightforward tool, it's probably going to be a really good pick for you. Regardless of any character you pick. It's going to be good on pretty much everyone. So we're going to put... While it doesn't have an element, he, un, un element, arms that don't knock down armored opponents is heavily underrated in this scene, I would say. So very underrated. Because you can do amazing things with an un, un, uncharged arm or an arm that can't knock down an armored opponent. It just allows you to chip them so much. So very much. Heading into the next arm, we're going to be seeing the counterpart to the bub, buff. Now this arm's pretty much going to go the exact same way. It gets bigger when it's charged, uh, it's extremely good for boxing, maybe not as good as bub, but about as good. Now the big trick between the two is that this one's very homing related. When you launch it out, for the most part it's going to kind of do its own thing and it will chase the opponent for you. Making it a lot easier just to kind of autopilot. Here, we're actually gonna... We will put it in order. There. Making it allow you to effectively autopilot with it. Just throw out a flurry of arms. And be very, very safe with it. This arm is honestly pretty underrated, I believe, in the scene. It is used very effectively and very often. But I would not be surprised to see it be used more, and it be even more effective than it already is. It's a very player, it's a very beginner-friendly tool, and it will see its way to the end game very effectively. So we're gonna put it over here, just ahead of the bub, as that homing does give it a very distinctive edge. Our next arm on this tier list is going to be the Chakram. Now, the Chakram is an unfortunate arm. It sustained a lot of very... Un it, it's, it's been a very good arm since the beginning of arms. Having a massive body to it, it's a giant spinning saw blade that travels much like the boomerang, but right now at a much slower speed and with a little bit less tracking. So, but it does also have a stun ability. Now, the stun ability doesn't get seen too very often with the Chakram because you have to be very close to your foe for it to be able to connect properly. When it connects though, it can open up your opponent to being, or no, not stun, flinch, sorry. So it has a flinch property to it that it, the time it takes for it to recover so that you can punish or take advantage of the fact that your opponent is flinched is very limited in most cases. You're probably not going to be able to land a grab. You'll probably be able to follow up with whichever other arm you have in tow or if you throw out a rush. Those are about the two main ways you can take advantage of it with extreme close range, allowing you to follow up with a grab. Overall, the Trocom, even though it has sustained numerous nerfs since the inception of it, it's still very powerful and is still very effective. 
The big thing with it though is that it's situational. There are a lot of characters will, where you will put yourself at great risk and potentially to a degree you'll be throwing a match if you go in against them with the chakram. So you want to plan things out, equip the chakram for the right situations, for the right foes, and utilize it against them. Overall, this arm works pretty well on a lot of characters. Not all of them. You do want to play... You do need to be playing specific characters generally to be able to utilize it properly. Otherwise, you're just going to be awkwardly walking around with a very flimsy tool. And it's not going to work out very well for you. But when you have it in the right situation, it's very powerful. And overall, it's going to be more consistently powerful than the other two we already have on the two, or tier list. Our next arm in this game, in this list, is going to be the Chilla. Now, this one, along with a couple of the others, are some of the best gloves in this game. And what makes the Chilla a very powerful arm is while it's not the strongest at boxing, it doesn't have much curve, so it's a pretty straightforward bullet, but it does have a pretty large body to it, and it has the ice element. Now, most of you are pretty aware of how good Chilla is at utilizing the ice element. And without art, without much to say, it's going to be the highest tiered ice elemented arm in this game because of how good it is at doing ice chains compared to every other arm that has the element of ice. It retracts more quickly than any of the others, and it's a lot harder to catch it for, or it's a lot harder for an opponent to react to it, so you're probably going to be able to bait them out into things and set them up for a lot of damage. The Chilla comes out at a very high speed, making it extremely dangerous and a very powerful tool. When the Chilla glove goes into rush, it does throw out a flurry, much like every other glove. But while that is not always the most effective tool, it works very well in a lot of situations and you can very likely catch your opponent and get some good damage in. It's a little weaker on the rush damage, but the ice chains alone are more than enough for this arm to easily be probably one of the best arms out there. Uh, I'm going to put it... We're going to put it above these two, but just behind the Biffler. It's probably one of the best arms in the game. And is one of the sole reasons why, even after all of the nerfs, this one has also sustained since the first pack or first release of arms. It's still like one of the best arms in the game. And why default twin tell is such a scary thing. It used to be better than what it is right now. You don't, you don't even want to imagine how bad it was back then. <laughs> Mm. Our next arm on the tier list is going to be the Clapback. The Clapback is a very, very dangerous arm. It can be effective at a distance, it can be very effective at close range, and the best way to explain it is think of the Mirror Shield from the Legend of Zelda series. When it's deployed, it will reflect an opponent's arm back at them. It will reflect pretty much anything save dragons, the bullet from the lockjaw. The lockjaw itself it will reflect, but the energy shot, it won't reflect that. And grabs. Anything else that Oh, and the players, characters. Anything else that comes in contact with the clapback will be reflected whichever which way it came. Uh, if the clapback is charged, it will also ensure that the reflected arm is also charged. So, an if you have a clapback, and you charge it up and set it up, and your opponent throws out an uncharged nade, the reflection will be a charged nade, and it will do the full explosion effect on them. 
The clapback is very effective tool for stopping very straightforward approaches, walling out some of the strongest arms in this game, most of the gloves, and also just a very obstructive tool that can allow you to pressure an opponent very effectively. Certain arms in this game, the clapback, the dragons being the prominent cases here, when deployed, you can actually walk into it and that will allow for an immediate retraction that has very little retraction time, which means you can immediately throw out a new clapback, you can throw out a grab, you can do a lot out of that and be very safe. It's actually a pretty solid approach technique for a lot of players that they will utilize to just give the opponent a hard time. The rush of the clapback is also exceptional as it's got a huge body to it and as it's classified as a heavy arm, it will be considered a super heavy arm which means that the only thing that can contest with it when it's in rush is either another shield that is deployed or another heavy arm that's under rush. I should also make note, when it is being deployed or when it is charging, it does consider itself a heavy arm. Which means that if an opponent throws out a Megaton to counteract the clapback, it will go down rather than attack the opponent or get set up. But while it's set up, it's considered some an entirely different entity and will just reflect anything. Megaton will get reflected by it. The clapback takes about three shots before it gets knocked down. And if it does get knocked down, you will be left basically disarmed for a short period of time. So generally just utilizing its pressure, charging it out when it starts getting weakened as it immediately refreshes once you pull it back in. I just thought, wouldn't be interesting if it actually took like 10 seconds or something like that for each tick to recharge. Meaning that like, well maybe not 10 seconds, but like 5 seconds or something like that. So like you could more effectively hold it out and just let it sit there for longer. But if your opponent's attacking it a lot, then you can't use it nearly as much. It would probably make it a lot more balanced. So overall, the clapback is a very powerful tool. Uh, it is pretty prominent in the scene. With a lot of high tier plays, especially on Kid Cobra, taking advantage of it. It is a little technical though, and takes a bit of, good pr a bit of practice to be able to utilize it effectively. So overall, we are going to put it, it can be count, do keep in mind, it can be countered by curved arms as they're going to be far less likely, or blorbs or something of the sorts, they're going to be a lot less likely to meet with the clapback as they're probably going to go around it left, right, or above. It's definitely an A tier arm, not an S tier. There's only a couple arms that really come to mind for me for an S tier arm. Our next arm is going to be the Coolerain. So the Coolerain is very similar to the Boomerang. It's a little bit slower, but I believe it has a larger body to it. It doesn't have the wind element, instead having an ice element. And overall that changes it up a little bit, makes it a little bit less effective. You can get some nice ice chains, but the time it takes for it to retract, uh, your opponent's probably going to have a little bit of an easier time working around it, getting some punishes, or just kind of surviving against it. It's a lot easier to see coming, and overall makes it a lot less effective of a rain. So we're just going to quickly slip it into B tier and move on. Our next arm on this tier list is going to be the Cracker. And the Cracker, it's a light arm, and it has some pretty interesting things going along with it. The light arms in this game generally all act very differently. While they do get outweighed by pretty much everything else in the game, uh, they have the, fa there's the fact that they have multiple projectiles on pretty much every one can allow it 
two just bypass those arms. You punch down one shot of the Biffler, two more still coming at you. The Cracker kind of follows up in a confetti st spread style, or more of a shotgun spread, where it gets two shots that kind of spin around like a corkscrew. It goes around like that, as it and it spreads out, opens up a little bit more as it chases down its opponent. The larger the girth, the bigger that spin, which also obviously means the bigger the hitbox. In order to fully knock down a cracker, you would need to knock both of these arms down, which isn't always the easiest task, and when you are forced to have to deal with it, there's a lot of cases where you are just going to get very pressured out. The cracker comes in with the fire element, allowing it to do some decent damage, removes the rush gauge, and comes out pretty quickly. It's a very effective tool, pretty powerful, but overall, much like the Blur, it kind of gets overshadowed by other tools that literally do its job better. In so many cases, you're probably going to look at, I personally honestly see it just in a void. The Cracker is an approachable, useful, powerful tool. It'd probably be a B tier arm, but because of the fact that there's so many literally better choices to pick, in most cases, it's probably the only thing really going for it is its rush, which much like the Biffler is actually very easy to knock down. It does do a lot of damage though, but we're probably going to put it right behind the Chakram. Still a good arm. It's not as... Not nearly as hurt her as the Blorb is by the existence of any other arm in this game. But it's probably not going to be seen too much. You don't see it too often because most people prefer a certain other arm over it in pretty much every case. And so you just see that. The next arm that we've got on this list is going to be the fire dragon now it's not actually called a fire dragon it's just the dragon but we'll call it the fire dragon because the the other side is the ice dragon and it just makes more sense the fire dragon obviously this one comes equipped with the fire element and the dragons have a they play very specially very unique playstyle to them they have some of the faster grabs in this game as they're meant to be long range tools. And how they work is when you set up a, a dragon, you punch it out and it kind of goes into a position some, wherever you've kind of thrown it out and it sets up there and then it opens up its mouth and shoots a laser. Now you can adjust the head from there a little bit to kind of adjust its aim. But overall it's not gonna, it kind of focuses on that area and then there's a light adjustment. It's not gonna go over here. It's not gonna go up like that. It's gonna, at best, kinda do that. That said, this is very effective for setting it up in a certain position. Say you're coming down from a landing, you throw it up above you, and now your opponent can't really effectively punch it down. So it can get you some very safe pokes and punishes, and we see that very much even today in a lot of competitive play. People effectively using fire or ice dragons just to poke and pester an opponent and get so much safe damage. Overall, the fire dragon isn't nearly seen as often as the ice one, only does a little bit more damage, but beyond that, they're pretty much the same thing. When you throw out the rush for a dragon, it acts very similarly to how it does normally, but the blast is much larger and it's a heavyweight blast. So your opponent's going to have a lot harder time knocking it down. That said, it is very slow, so you generally want another arm to couple up with it to take advantage of its damage. The Fire Dragon, we are going to be putting... We'll put it as a C tier, because it does have the weakness as well. It's a little more difficult for most characters to use overall uh most of them aren't gonna have as nearly of a solid time
It's not going to nearly have as solid of a time I utilized by most characters. Generally, there's only going to be a handful that can use it very well, but most will generally be able to make it work to some degree. And once again, in most cases, it's kind of overshadowed by another element or another drag arm. The next arm, and one of my personal favorites, we have ourselves the Fun Chuck. Now, much like the Bird Chuck, the Fun Chuck has two different properties to it. In this case, they're reversed though, where the wide flat approach is used while in the air, and this vertical kind of swing curve is used while on the ground. Now, normally the Ice element is more effective than the flinch element in the fact that it's got a lot of combo potential and just generally good abilities. The fun chuck though is a little bit faster and this, the flinch from that fun chuck is probably going to be a little bit more rewarding more often than the bird chuck's freeze. The fun chuck is also much more commonly used in very spammy approaches, spammy plays, just because of the fact that it has a much easier access to an ex one of the biggest selling points to the Funchuck. The Funchuck and the Paras are two of the fastest recovering arms in the game, provided that they are recovering right on your body. So how that basically works is, say you've got a... Say you've got six Slapamanders coming in from your right. With any other, well, with any other arm, you'd probably be able to punch down the first one, and then you would get hit by the next one, juggled by the third one, and then the other two, the rest of them would miss because you're on the floor and you're invulnerable. The fun chuck, uh, with proper timing, you would be able to parry each and every single one of those down with the fun chuck, and then as soon as the sixth ones come out, and you've parried it, you would throw out the fun chuck one more time and it would go chase down your opponent. This is why I say the fun chuck is a solid counter to double fun chuck. Because the further, obviously, just like any other arm, the farther away the arm is from you, the longer it takes for it to recover. The fun chuck's one of those arms where the long, farther, it takes even longer the farther away it is but it takes even less time the closer it is. So generally it's really good at close range and you don't want to use it too much. It's very safe at a distance, but you're going to have the best results at close range as you're going to have very easily outbox a lot of opponents. Gives you stun combos, gives you some good reads, gives you good setups. It makes it a very powerful and dangerous arm. And while the Burchuck also has this innate parrier ability, it requires you to be in the air to most effectively utilize that, so you're not going to nearly see it as often on the Burchuck. Maybe only being able to parry one arm quickly, and then you would probably get caught by anything else. So overall, it's not an amazing arm. It does have a lot of weaknesses to it, but it is a solid tool. It can work very effectively on pretty much any character is definitely a B tier arm. Effective, accessible, reliable, it's good. Our next arm for the tier list is going to be our first poison element and one of the primary arguments as to why most people don't want to use Blorb beyond it being funny. The Glusher! So what's the difference between the two? Well, the Blorb's faster at boxing, kind of, and it's got blind. So what does the Glusher have over that? Well, it's got poison, which is going to more consistently be more rewarding for most users in terms of damage output and opportunities to take. Uh, they have, I believe the Blorb is a little bit larger, but the Glusher also has an explosion to it. Now this isn't an explosion arm, so this makes it a very powerful tool because while it can explode on an opponent, canceling out rush, deflect, that explosion doesn't do too much damage, but it does stack poison, 
and if you catch that stun, you might be able to follow up with a very strong combo. It also, they do about the same amount of damage on Rush, but then Glusher essentially does more because of that additional poison stack. So, overall, the Glusher is, just plays out a lot more effectively than what the Blorb is and in how it plays. So, we are going to move the Glusher over to... It's... We'll say about here. That's a pretty good spot for it. It's another very situational arm. It is capable of... It's not going to work in all situations, but couple up with the right tools, it's going to be very powerful and very dangerous. But I still feel like it has a bit of work to go before it becomes a really good... You startled me, Nyx! You startled me, love! Thank you for the sub! <sighs> okay. I'm never expecting those. That actually genuinely startled me. Oh gods. Why am I why am I so scared of things? Hmm. So overall, it's still pretty situational. It can be punished pretty hard, but it's a solid empty air. The explosion really helps it out and making it a much more prominent arm. And it, it fits nicely in the C list. Moving on with this tier list, uh, we've got the Guardian. Now, this shield arm is very similar to the Clapback in the fact that when it's deployed, it does have its own properties. It takes three hits to get knocked down and is generally pretty scary. Now, that's about where the similarities end. That when... Now, that's where the similarities end. So how the Guardian kind of works from then on is while the clapback, when it's deployed, it sits in front of you. The Guardian does a chase. It kind of it kind of chomps its little mouth. It's like... Ah, 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 and it chases you down because it's going to bite you. And when it has the shock element active... Or the stun element activated on it, I... Uh, it has one of the longest stuns in the game, allowing you to set up very safe combos, a good grab. Guardian has one of the fastest grabs in this game alongside the clapback. So you freeze, you stun your opponent and you have a very safe opportunity to go in for that punish and just get more, even more damage off of it. While it is easy for your opponent to just shield it, generally by time they've blocked the Guardian and throw it another attack, you can probably get another one out there. Its rush is pretty effective, even bigger than the clapback. It's a little bit slower on the chase, but it will wall out pretty much anything that tries to contest it. Overall though, this arm does struggle in the scene, as when it does initiate its final chase, it actually is considered a medium arm in a lot of cases. I've paired it down with the fun chuck with no problems. You could probably do that with the buffs, the bubs, the parasols. You can beat it down very quickly as it doesn't have that reflection property. And whenever it gets hit, it gets stuttered for a moment, which allows you to just chain it down until it kind of loses its effect. With proper use and approach, it is very dangerous. It's very powerful. There is a member of the EU community that I know who can use it exceptionally and be a very dangerous player with it but a solid approach will generally give you a very will make the guardian a very easy thing to counter overall we're going to place the guardian on We'll put it here. It's very situational on how it plays. So, the reason why the Guardian works very- Why the Guardian is in the C tier is because of the fact that 
there are a lot of counters to it. There are a lot of things that can force it down. It does have some power. It can be used very well, but once again, it's a very situational tool. You have to be the right kind of person for it to really shine. Otherwise, it's going to really struggle in a lot of matches. Heading, moving on with the tier list, our next arm is going to be the ever classic Malief brand homie. Subscribe now to become a homie yourself for only $5.99. Act now and you'll get a special offer to add a song to the stream playlist, only available to Twitch viewers. Hurry now, this promotion ends probably never because I'm probably just going to keep doing this. The homie is very similar to gloves in the way that it approaches and kind of how it plays, but with a much more long distance m approach to it. So how the homie kind of works is it's a medium weight arm. It's pretty effective at boxing and punching down, but it has, as is with the name, a lot of homing to it. So it kind of plays very similarly to the buff, but imagine the buff with an explosion and that's pretty much what the homie is. It does take a lot longer for it to retract though, but overall it's a pretty, pretty powerful tool. It's a really effective anti-boxing setup as it allows you to box, but during those opportunities where you're not boxing anymore or you don't want to box, you can get some incredible angles that will allow you to easily work around any other glove. The homie is also capable of doing some very high damage with its rush. It's a it's a, about as slow as the dragon, maybe a little bit faster in how it's telegraphed and how people can see it, but it causes a massive explosion wherever it stops. Even if that place where it stops is right in front of an opponent's face, covers a lot of range and the initial blast of the homie does about 250 damage. Couple it up with pretty much any other arm, and you can chain some intense damage. If you put on two of the two homies together, there are a lot of cases where you will, you can get 700 damage off of a single double homie loadout rush. Uh, it's a little tricky, a little unwieldy to use. It does have the explosive property, which means that if an opponent punches it while it's charged, it can blow you up and it can hurt you a little bit, cause some problems. Overall, it's a pretty safe arm. It's pretty effective. It's not super good, but it can do a lot of things pretty well. In most cases, it is going to be less effective than another arm that's in that will be coming up in this tier list. But I'd probably put it we're gonna put it right along the Dragon, Chakram, and Guardian for... C tier is really shaping up to be the situational, but good load list right now. I think that's kind of what I was intending for it to be like. You can get good results with it, but they're not... They're definitely not good arms in most case In all cases. I'm gonna put it behind the Dragon. So let just quickly going over how the tier list looks right now is S tier is a very powerful arm. It has it might have one weakness, but overall if you put it on your setup, it's going to be very helpful. Your opponent's probably going to struggle against it a lot and it's going to be very rewarding in most cases. A tier is it's a very solid look, arm. But there are going to be the odd caser here or there where it might not always be the best choice, but it's a great tool. B tier is... It's a good arm. It works well in a lot of cases. But in the grand scheme of things, it's probably... They're, they're solid picks. 
B tier is going for solid picks, things that are going to work out alright. You're probably going to do well with them. And you can kind of have it as like... You can probably have it do good jobs without needing to be too worried about it. Uh, C tier being mostly situational tools that are very good at countering specific things. And the more I look at it, that's actually... So yeah, Dragon is a very good situational arm in the fact that it's really good on certain characters, but it's really tricky to use on other characters, and there's certain opponents that will just have an easy time countering it. Homie, very much the same thing. It requires a very specific playstyle and approach to generally be able to maximize it. Chakram, you need the right opponent, and you need to be able to get close. Guardian, you need to be a good, really good player with it, and you have to be able to create like very good situations for yourself, which is tricky. Glusher is a good counter for certain setups. Cracker is really good for catching very specific occasions, like countering Ribbon Girl or Dr. Coil. Birdchuck is really good for countering things like Helix. All of them very situational. This next arm, though, is not situational. It's the Hydra. So, like the Biffler, the Hydra starts off with three shots. But while the Biffler kind of does this, the Hydra just kind of does this. It just spreads out like this. It makes it a lot harder for your opponent to punch down. And the big trick with it, when it's charged, it doesn't... When it's charged, if you knock down this one, these two are still coming at ya. Still going at ya! You can't stop them. They keep chasing you. The only time that you can stop all three at once is when it's in rush mode. And even then, much like the Biffler, uh, if you catch it, if you're able to catch its movement, it's pretty easy to punish. But if you're not 100% ready for it, it's probably gonna hit you and you're probably gonna take a lot of damage. It's, while it can be somewhat vulnerable when you block it successfully, that's about the only weakness it has, is your shield. Every other option is pretty unsafe against it. As you can throw out a dragon, it might block one of the one or two of the shots, but there's probably going to be a third that might reach you. It's a fire element, so if it hits you while it's charged, it's going to knock you down. And it's just going to make the match a lot more difficult and troublesome. This is also another, alongside the Bert, or the Chilla and the Chakram, another arm that has sustained numerous, numerous nerfs. Now, while the Chakram has become much weaker and is much easier to punish now, the reason why the Chilla and the Hydra kind of go into their places, their positions in the tier list is because these are arms that just by the definition of what they are, even before you start implementing them, they can only be one of two things. They can either A, be incredibly powerful and effective and relevant to the scene at all times, or B, completely useless and nobody ever uses it because it's garbage. Those are the only two cases that it could really be. It can't be anywhere in between. If Chilla stops being an A-tier arm, it's probably going to go down to C, D, E, or even potentially F. Hydra would very likely have a similar case to that. But yeah, overall, Hydra, very powerful arm. It doesn't do the most damage, but the knockdowns, the juggles, the rushes... Overall, it's just... it works well for a tool, and allows you to do some very incredible plays. The next arm on the tier list is the Ice Dragon. Now, the Ice Dragon is very similar to the Fire Dragon, but it has Ice Chains, which kind of allow it to be more effective at doing more damage at times. It freezes your opponent. It stalls out the match by a huge degree, allowing you to just give your opponent so many problems. Granted, there are going to be cases where the Fire Dragon is more effective, but the speed of the Dragon's grabs, while it is a little bit slow on getting Ice Chains sometimes, and if your opponent is keeping an eye open, you're probably not going to get many Ice Chains, 
the pokes you can get with that thing, the freeze. The freeze just causes so many problems for an opponent. It's not even about getting ice chains with the ice dragon. It's freezing your opponent and forcing them to wait three seconds to be unfrozen so that they can continue the match. All the while you're building rush, you're getting chip damage on them, weakening their shield. It can work very effectively and can be a very dangerous and frustrating arm to play against. It's just a little bit more consistent than the Fire Dragon. And I'm going to put it over in the B tier list because of that. You can More characters are going to be able to work with it effectively as it rewards the zoning play that dragons generally like a little bit better than the Fire Dragon does. Our next tier, or our next arm, as promised, is an S tier. Because Nick said they wanted it to be an S tier, so... So our next arm, the Lockjaw, no. So, the Kablammer, no, you're not an F tier, love. Love, I promise you, you're not an F tier. The Kablammer is a part of the Hammer family. It's a heavy type arm, so it's going to pass through most arms in this game. But it does have a bit of a curve to it. Actually, most heavy arms have some very interesting properties to them, except for the next three that we're going to be going through. The Kablammer is pretty solid in certain cases. It does a lot of damage when it connects fully. In a charge state, it does 110 damage, plus an additional 50 on explosion splash damage. And its rush does is capable of doing a lot of damage as well. It can, it's also a pretty solid anti-air tool. Now, all of that said, it is pretty slow when it's coming out, which can kind of help because it lets you wall out an opponent's attack. It is pretty big, so that also helps when it comes to walling out opponent's attacks. But it's an explosive arm, which means that huge size, if your opponent just goes at it, while you're trying to set something up, you're, they're probably going to blow you up. Very easily. It's probably the easiest explosive arm to punish in this game. Uh, it also has... The hammers have some very strange properties in this game that make them sometimes not even usable. Sometimes they're literally unviable. Like, you, there's been cases where I throw out the whammer or I throw out a kablammer. This is the opponent. The hammer hits like this. Like you see, from how I see it, it's connecting with them. But the hitbox is like over here. So they actually don't get hit. Even with the explosion. Sometimes the explosion doesn't work. Because the club Lammer also has a weird property where if it's in the air, it's kind of like a pancake explosion. But on the ground, it's also a pancake explosion. So there's a little bit of a body to it. But if your opponent jumps, it's a lot easier for them just to get out of that explosion compared to Nade, uh, Tri-Blast. It's not a hard explosion to get out of. And also the explosion property is a lot easier to parry through or sh perfect shield through against a Kamblammer than it is any other explosive arm. I want to place it higher. I want to like this arm. I have faith that it might do something at some point eventually. Steelhead makes it work, kind of. It's not a good arm. The biggest thing I can say, or the last thing I can potentially say, is that in the situations where you want to use the Kablammer, the Blorb's a better pick. And the Blorb's been... And pretty much everything's a better pick over the Blorb. Yet the Blorb is a better pick than the Kablammer. It destroys Helix? Sometimes it destroys Helix. Once again, a Glusher will probably destroy Helix better. A Whammer would probably destroy Helix better. Birdchuck would destroy Helix better. So...
It's not un unviable. It's not an F tier. There's not going to be a single arm on this list that hits F tier. Nothing is unviable. It's just really difficult to use well. It's generally... It's not unviable, but it's strongly recommended against using it. Honestly, the best thing to use a Kablammer for is probably a Heavy. It's probably best used against Heavies, ironically. Something that's also very good against Heavies is the Lockjaw. Now, the Lockjaw also contains the explosion property, the explosive property, but unlike the Kablammer and all of the other explosion arms, it kind of cheats like the Glusher, in which case it's got that explosion, but you can't cause it to explode on the user by punching it when it's charged. It'll just take arm damage. Now, the Lockjaw's prob- beyond the shields, the Lockjaw's probably the strongest heavy arm in the game. While it doesn't have a strong element against armored players, it has two bullets to it. Two. Which means that it will oftentimes outbox heavy arms. When in a charged state, it shoots a blast of explosion, and then the Lockjaw goes and starts chomping after the guy. He's like, nom 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 nom. He goes and bites people. I love it when- I love it when arms bite people. I don't know why, just the idea of the Guardian just walking over going, Gah! Or the Lockjaw just walking up to you going, Gah, 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 Gah. It amuses me so much. <laughs> it makes me very happy that they exist. So it's got those two per shots to it and overall is capable of doing an intense amount of damage because of that. No single hit does a lot of damage, but couple it all together and you're probably going to get more damage out of a single lockjaw, charged lockjaw hit than pretty much any other arm in the game. As it's got the two projectiles, as I've said before, it can parry pretty much any other arm in this game. Uh, it can contest with shields pretty effectively. It's it's a little slow though, so solid evasive movement will allow the opponent to get around it. It does all the rush in it is also a little tricky to use, usually requiring a good setup arm alongside it. And even then, there are times where you set it up properly and the lockjaw will still miss. But dear god, the shield pressure that on that thing. You don't even have to get a safe... You don't even have to get a rush that's guaranteed to connect with them. Lockjaw rush? A single lockjaw rush will probably take three quarters of an opponent's shield on full. Which means you just need a sub-decent other arm to do shield pressure. Or if they're already shield pressured and say so you got lockjaw homie. You go in for the rush. Go with the lockjaw chip all the way their shield, and then throw the homie and bam, you still got a 300 damage rush even though it was supposed to just be a bunch of shield chip. Lockjaw and if we're going to be talking about a potential shield breaker combo loadout, uh, Lockjaw Tri-Blast is a personal favorite of mine in the fact that if you have an opponent cornered and just throw out a rush, you will get about 300 damage including shield chip damage and the full brunt of the rush afterwards on your opponent with those arms, even if they're at full shield to start the rush with. That's how powerful the Lockjaw's rush is. We are going to put this one... There's only going to be two arms, two heavy arms, beyond the... well, three. We're going to include the clapback in it. But there's only going to be three heavy arms that will ever make it B or above. Where do I want to put this, though? I don't think it's that good. Actually, our B list is, like, very... We'll put it here. 
I might be being a little favorable. Y'all might disagree with me. I think it's a really good arm. It can be countered by some really strong movement, but overall the amount of shield pressure that thing can do, and just how safe being able to use it effectively can be, you... It can be scary good. Oh, I should also make notes. Lockjaw, Homie, Seagy, and Glusher Rush all have explosions to them. Actually, I believe the Blorb would be called added into this. All of those arms, when they explode during rush, they can blow you up too. So say you're just playing around with your friend and you throw out a homie rush and it accidentally hits the pillar in front of you. You're going to be taking 250 damage from yourself. Good job. Moving on with the tier list, we do have ourselves a couple of heavy arms coming up. The next one is going to be the base of what people think of when it comes to the heavy arms. The Megaton. It's a giant purple ball. It moves in a straight line. It's a heavy and it does a lot of damage on impact. Uh, this arm is unelemented and it makes up for that fact by doing a lot of damage. Probably being one of the best heavy boxing arms. Which admittedly is not still not a very good thing. If you're looking for a boxing arm you probably shouldn't be picking a heavy. But if you want a box with a heavy, it's probably the best one to go with. It's very direct, and the rush does a lot of damage. There's not much to really say about it. It's alright, it's good. It's got a nice build to it. It's kind of fast. But it's not, like, spectacular. I'm currently playing it in my loadout. I'm, playing, I'm enjoying it. I'm seeing what I can do with it. We're going to put it... Right behind the blorb. It's not great. It's alright, but it's... It's it's basically just blorb, but more boring. But sometimes that can be better. It depends on your loadout, how you're playing and approaching things. I guess we'll do that. Wow, look, the bottom of the tier list is all heavy arms. It's almost like they poorly, it's almost like heavy arms are just really difficult to balance properly. Next on the tier list, we have the Megawatt. Now, this is the Megaton, but when it's charged, it has a stun element to it. Uh, this stun element is not nearly as long as the Guardian. But it's still... It's still pretty decent. Uh, it's a lot... It's a good punish arm. You can get some decent damage off of it. And whenever you stun with it, you get that 130. And then you get a follow up with something. Something I haven't made note of. Heavy arms... Beyond the Blorb and the Glusher, every other heavy arm has this, except those two, uh, gets an additional 5 damage on a grab when you go for that and it connects. This is important because that allows Master Mummy to be able to be the only character in the game that has a 3... that is capable of KOing you with 3 combos. 3 2 hit combos. Basically, 6 hits. Yeah. So, how it kind of works is Megawatt does 130 damage. Master Mummy does 200 damage when he grabs. He also gets an additional 5 damage for having a single Megawatt equipped. Which means that the Megawatt grab combo does 335 damage. Each character in arms has 1,000 health. That means that by two points on each hit, Master Mummy, well, about one point on each hit. Like, this is a very minute difference. Master Mummy is doing enough damage with each of these combos that he will take a third of your health every time. And it's just enough that your opponent will likely not get the magic pixel. Well, no, they won't. Which means that you will be able to 
Hit them with a megawatt, grab, megawatt, grab, megawatt, grab, done. No other no other setup in this game can, is capable of doing that without having to rely on rush or some kind of other set, setup. Potentially Blorb, but that one's not as guaranteed, and I probably wouldn't consider that. So, Megawatt sounds very powerful. It's slow, though. It takes forever to reach your opponent. It's really good at aggressive play, but if your p opponent is patient and shielding well, they're probably going to not have too many struggles against it. Once again, it's a very situational arm. But it's one of the more effective situational arms. Generally, just working out in more cases. You Sometimes the shock element just makes that much of a difference where it goes all the way from being a D tier to, like, top of the C tier. It's crazy sometimes. But yeah, this shock also, just to quickly clarify, it's one of the shorter ones in this game. So you have to follow up with something quickly. And for the most part, it's just to allow you to continue pressure, pressuring. In a lot of cases, you're not going to get a grab combo off of it. But if you do, that's very rewarding. The next arm in our tier list is going to be the Nade. The Nade is another of the Glove family, which inherently means that it is automatically one of the best tools in this game. Uh, this one, though, does not have any homing, but it has an exceptional amount of curve. Allowing you to get some really good aims. If you are good at reading your opponent's movement, you can punish them very hard with this tool. Capable of doing very high amounts of damage. And the rush is pretty exceptional too, especially by glove standards. The One of the big, biggest weaknesses of it is it's pretty bad at boxing. But the shield pressure allows you to do kind of balances that out. And overall, it's just the boxing that's really what it struggles with. It's prob by far one of the best arms in this game. We're going to put it in S tier. There's... When you're facing off against a opponent with double nade, or even a single nade... They're probably, if you're not an armored unit, you're going to probably have not the funnest of times. This is one of the arms that you will have to learn how to play against. Because you're going to see it a lot, it's going to hurt a lot, and without experience, you're probably going to get knocked down a lot. It also has some pretty impressive confirms for rushes. It's really good. It's very good. Actually, on the note of that, I've ran double nade against heavies as a counter against them, or nade whammer. It actually works very well. You have to play very safe and patiently, but you can use that just to destroy people. There's so many people that will just fall to nade whammer. As a heavy. Like, I've bested Mechanicas, I've bested Master Mummies. It's good. It's really good. The next pick on, or the next arm on this tier list is the Parabola. Now, this is a pretty tricky arm to use. It's not necessarily great, as it doesn't effectively parry as well as the Parasol, but it does have a shock element to it, which allows you to get some nice combo opportunities. It does move pretty quickly, quickly darting out at your opponent and then having some pretty cool chase mechanics to it where it shoots out a lot like a bullet at first and then for the last half last quarter of it or so it just at a relatively medium pace it will chase the opponent uh if your opponent is cornered or trying to run away from it you can easily bait them into a lot of punishes a lot of setups overall a very solid tool it can get countered by a lot of things it's definitely it's rush is pretty nice, but this is another one of those, if you're going to use this arm, 
There's a very clear better arm for it. And unlike the Lorbing Glusher, it's like, when I compare the two, like Parabola can be very nice in a lot of cases. Parasol's probably gonna be a lot more consistent for you. It's a good arm, but it can get countered by so much. It can, it can, there's a lot of things that it can be weak to. And also, my favorite thing about it is when you throw out the rush, sometimes it will actually glitch and leave you extremely vulnerable, as sometimes it will miss the wall and it will just keep going for a solid 3-4 seconds. Which means that if you miss with the Parabola Rush, you can be vulnerable to an easy punish from your opponent. So you have- you, you've gotta hit it. It's a D tier. It has good potential, it can do some cool things. But for the most part, it's gonna probably be bested by the Parasol. Which has the wind element instead of the electric element, allowing it to do solid knockbacks. And giving you many of the similar opportunities that the boomerang offers. It also is a very, very solid defensive arm. Where the parabola can kind of do a bit of parries. Parasol, much like the fun chuck, is the counterpart to in which if you had six bubs or buffs coming at you and it was coming at your the side that you had the parasol set up you could parry all six of them throw out the parasol and punish them a single parasol is the hard counter to two parasols to go into that again as a strong defensive parry arm is going to be more effective at parrying its own counterpart if they're used aggressively while it's a lot more situational, it's a little bit more defensive. I, I no, nah, it's pretty good. Uh, let's see. We're gonna put it. I'd honestly say it's better than Fun Chuck. I'm also gonna move this down. I'm going to also move the block jaw down. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I think I think that's fine. Parasol is just short of being a really good arm. The wind element gives it so much strength though. Great rushes, good combo potential. A lot of damage off the rush, very effective defensively, and can work pretty well aggressively. It's pretty solid. Makes your set B tier. B tier is not a bad place to be. I mean, look, it's got the sunglasses. Who don't like wearing sunglasses? Speaking of B... Well, or maybe... We'll see. I'll think about it for a moment. While I'm thinking about, we might as well talk about this arm. The Phoenix! So, the Phoenix is another of the fire elemented arms. And this one actually is one of the few cases where it has a counterpart where in most cases, I would probably say the counterpart is better. But... Unlike a lot of those other arms, when you look at this arm compared to that one, there are actually very clear advantages. This one's a lot safer to use. While its po combo potential isn't nearly as strong, the damage is a lot more consistent. It's a lot easier to recover with it if you whiff. Uh, it moves a lot faster. It does have some nice rush potential, and it's a little bit bigger if I'm not mistaken. The rush is also a little bit more damaging, which kind of makes it pretty effective. Overall, if you're looking for just what's better, Thunderbird or Phoenix, chances are you're probably going to 
most people are probably going to say Thunderbird's better than Phoenix. But the Phoenix is a really good pick for a lot of situations. And in a Void, even with most on most characters, like you're probably going to be able to use it pretty well. Most characters can use it very effectively. Uh, we're going to put it... Let's put the Phoenix here. That's alright. Yeah, I think that's alright. Yeah, we'll stick with that. Carrying in on the tier list, we've got ourselves the Popper. Now this, unlike the Phoenix, as I referenced back on the Cracker, uh, the Popper is pretty much just a better Cracker. It covers the same range essentially. It, I might not be as easy to catch an opponent with it, but it does about the same damage with the opportunity for a juggle, which technically makes it do more damage. Uh, the Wind Element just really helps it shine and be a very powerful arm, especially with how safe its pokes are. You can do some amazing things with it. And it's not seen too often by a lot of players, but it is starting to creep up here and there by people. A lot of people are starting to get a good idea on how to use it effectively, when to play with it, and what to do with it. Uh... It's probably, as far as I'm concerned, it's definitely the best wind elemented arm in this game. It does have its weaknesses though. Let's put it right there. The rush also pretty effective, can be punched down pretty easily though. But, you're probably not going to have a rush that gets punched down, because you're going to just... It combos into itself, where you hit it with the popper, you use rush, and then you throw out the popper and the rush connects. Moving on to the next arm that's a little bit on the its situational side, we've got the Ram Ram. So pretty much everything is the exact same thing with the Ram Ram compared to the Chakram. There are slight property differences with speed, girth, uh, rush damage, general damage, but the main thing of interest between the two, Chakram is Fire Element, or Ram Ram is Fire Element, Chakram is Flinch Element. Which means that you're basically just picking between the two based on whether or not you want to immediately knock your opponent down, or you want to cause your opponent to flinch. So they're basically, they do have the strongest rush in this game, and that gives them a lot of strength, but you need to be able to build that strength safely and effectively. And most people can't do that very well with Chakram or Ram Ram. They usually have to rely on a very powerful arm otherwise to couple up with it. I was wondering why this tier list feels so weird, but then I realized that all the best, most of the best arms in this game have even been put on in here yet. We're still getting to them. So I might have to move some things down. We probably will. On the note of moving though, we are going to be approaching this next arm. The Retorcher! So much like the other light arms in this game, the Retorcher has three projectiles to it. It's got... Once you release the shot, it covers three little bullets that kind of do little wavy patterns as they chase after, and they kind of spread out in their own little, like, triangle, and they go, whoa, as they chase people. I, I regret making that action. That's... My life is a regret. Anyways, uh... So it can be a little difficult for an opponent, once again, to punch down. A Retorture and Revolver are pretty popular picks. If you're wanting to counter other Light Arms with a Light Arm, 
as the properties, the way it approaches, it's generally going to work pretty well at fighting back other light arms. Especially since it has three projectiles at it in it. When the Retorture connects, it's a fire element, so that does reward pretty safe knockdowns. You get a decent amount of damage, you get a good chain going. And it's generally pretty safe to, well, not very safe to use while charged and uncharged, but it's pretty safe. When it comes to rush though, it's probably one of the worst rushes in the game. Uh, literally just being, it's pretty quick, but it's literally a super direct shot. And if they're not directly in front of you, or you don't get a solid movement read, you're going to miss, and then you're left extremely vulnerable. So this one pretty much mandates that you have to have a good a sidearm to kind of pair, pair up with it, so that you can get a safe confirm. And even then, much like some of the other arms that I've discussed before, like the Lockjaw, you can get a solid confirm with, say, a nade, start punching them down, throw out the Retorture, and it'll just miss anyways. It just do be that way sometimes. So, it does have a couple of good opportunities, some good counters. We'll put it in C. It's another situational. The entire C list is just situationals. It's like, it's like where I, it's where I'm throwing all the arms that I'm like, ah, no, it depends on things. You're making me think too hard. It can work, but usually it's not gonna work. Revolver, uh, it's pretty similar to the Retorture. It kind of, it doesn't have the three spread wavy shot. It's just bullet after bullet after bullet. So it's a lot more direct. It's a lot easier for you to kind of set things up with it. And it has the stun element, which is difficult to follow up because it's for a very short period of time. And you do have to wait for all three bullets to fully re retract before you can do anything. So if the stun is from the first or second bullet, the only confirm you can do is a rush with the other arm, or just a standard hit with the other arm. If it the last bullet also hits, then you can get a grab. Sometimes. Overall, I, I've tried so many times, I've thought about it so often, here and there, pretty regularly. It's a worse retorture. I'd probably say it's, yeah, it's about there. It works pretty well, it can be safe, but in most cases you're probably going to be better off picking a different tool. Yes, I've beaten Doctor a Dr. Coil before with a re revolver equipped. Uh, I just got really good reads, and it would not It would have been a lot easier if I picked literally any other arm. That's more just flaunting than anything. Our next arms, uh, we're actually going to do two at once here because they're basically the same arm for one, except for one difference and very light variation between. We've got the roaster and the toaster. Now, the reason why we're putting them together is there's about three differences between the two. The first, well, four. First difference, they look different. One got a purple flame, one got a standard people flame. You know, usual stuff. Second, damage. Roaster does 140 on bait, or uncharged, and does a little bit more on rush than toaster. Toaster does about 130 of charged. Uh, the third reason, uh, roaster is slightly faster than toaster. Oh wait, no, there's five reasons. Fourth reason then, uh, Toaster has homing, while Roaster does not, which means that Toaster's a little bit safer. And then the fifth reason, Toaster's a lot safer for boxing compared to Roaster. So, 
it's more depends on how comfortable you are with wanting your own aim or how much you're wanting to box. Going with either of beyond that, you're literally just splitting hairs. Like in most cases, it's probably not even going to be too noticeable of a difference. Insert moment where Maliv has a mental breakdown because she despises firearms. Moving on with the tier list. We've got ourselves Nibbles. Or as he's actually recognized in the game, it's a Scorpid. But I call him Nibbles. Because he's cute and he's a little nibbler. Yes, I know he attacks with his tail. But he nibbles. He nibbles with his tail. He goes, yum. He's cute. So Nibbles has a cup, much like the Chucks, actually has a couple of properties to him. But he he's such his own creature. Not only because he is super cute. But because when you throw him on the ground, he crawls around a little bit and he kind of tracks the person and he's got his tail out, he's all ready. And when he gets close to them, he'll leap out and he'll bite them. Now, if it's poison, if he's charged, he does the poison stack on that. If it's uncharged, he just bites him. Uh, it is actually capable of catching light jumps, but not too high. It doesn't reach too very, it doesn't get too very high. But when you do launch Nibbles on the ground, it does start with a little bit of an arc. Like, he bounces like that, and then he does his walk. When you throw Nibbles on in the air, though, uh, he actually works like a boomerang light. Where it's not going to be as big of a curve, it's about more like this. And it's only this way or this way. You can't go close to that or that. It's just kind of that standard range. But... He does have a decent curve and he kind of works like a nice boomerang. He's Nibbles also has a very solid rush. It comes out pretty quickly and it's very powerful. Overall, uh, Nibbles the Scorpid is a little... He's not great in the grand scheme of things. I love him. He's cute. But he's really not great. Mo for the most part, I can see him being... I can see him being a bit higher than the place I'm going to put him. In the future, with more practice, more development, and more understanding. But he... Nibbles the Scorpion is going to evolve very much in similar positioning to Springtron and Misango in previous tier lists. In that he's getting tiered lowly. Not because he is bad. But because people just don't understand him yet. In future, future tier lists, if players were to pick up and start demonstrating the potential that Nibbles has, he could very easily climb up this tier list. Probably C tier somewhere along those lines. Might potentially somehow hit low Bs, but definitely can see him climbing up. The next arm on the list is going to be the Seeky. Now, the Seeky plays very similarly to the Homie in the fact that, once again, it kind of plays like a buff. It's got a lot of homing to it. It moves very freely. They almost kind of work like curve arms in the way that they kind of approach and how you first launch them. They do have a lot of chasing immediately after that first little bump, though. Now, the big difference between Seeky and Homie is the fact that Seeky has the shock element to it alongside the explosion. Which means that on a lot of opponents, it's probably just going to still be a knockdown. But against armored opponents, it will stun them alongside do that explosion and set up a bit of damage. So it does a lot of damage. And then they, when they get stunned by it, they're vulnerable for a very long time, much like the Guardian. Allowing you to get some pretty solid grabs or rush combos or whatever. Seeky does a little bit less damage than the Homie as well. But overall, it's probably going to be a little bit more rewarding. 
But the caveat is that usually it's going to be a lot riskier. Because like the explosion arms, uh, this one can explode if it's charged on your side and it gets hit. Unlike the other arms who just simply explode on you when that happens, a Siki stuns you. Leaves you vulnerable for a sizable amount of time, meaning that your opponent can get a punish on you. And it can really hurt. Overall, I'm going to play Siki just a little bit above the homie. Just because of that rewarding nature, but it is very dangerous and overall it's still pretty situational on the player and how they approach and play things. Next up on the tier list is the ever lovable little little beak of nightmares, the Scully. So the Scully is by far the fastest arm in the game. It's a light arm, it's very tiny, and it carries the poison element. It doesn't have a very strong rush, not doing too much damage, but it builds rush very quickly as it has one of the fastest retraction times, allowing you to quickly just dole out throw after throw after throw after throw after little poke after little poke, and you're going to be very safe throwing these out. As most arms will punch it down, but even after it's punched it down, you'll dodge out of the way of that arm, and then you'll throw out another Scully. Uh, th it's really good at catching temp- or er, forcing players off their tempo, as you just keep throwing so many of them that they're not able to find the opportunity to do their dash dances that they might want to do for deflects or anything of the sorts. Uh, adding poison on top of that, this one really takes advantage of those stalls because of- or the stutters because of the poison stack as it just comes out so quickly and moves so much that there's a lot of cases where you can just go for so many pokes, poke after poke after poke, and just push your opponent into pretty stressful situations. That said, it can get countered by a lot of arms. As it's a light arm, anything with a larger body is probably going to be able to wall it out. Uh, any light arm beyond that one is going to outbox it, while they're not going to recover as quickly, they kind of move at about a similar space, speed. And only one of the projectiles and most of them will kind of get knocked down by the Scully. So say a popper is coming at you and you throw your Scully, you're going to still get hit. You'd have to use both of your Scullies to stop the one popper. It's a really good arm. But I'd say it's just shy... Or is it... Hmm. I think it's earned its place. It's an A tier. Next up on our list... <clears throat> Next up on our list is going to be the Slamamander. Now, this is one of the few cases where it's still... Court's still out on this. It's, a it's hard to determine, really. But Slap and Slamamander are both very good arms. They do have a couple of weird hitboxes to them, but overall they're pretty consistent, pretty solid, pretty, re pretty reliable, and they do some good damage. Both have very difficult to use rushes, but you get an exceptional amount of either shield chip damage, or just standard damage off of the manders, if you get the rush to connect in any way. Ah. Now in most cases, the wind element I would say is better than any other element on an arm, but as it currently stands, most players, when using the Manders, have a bet have better results with the Slime Commander as opposed to the Slime Commander. And with that, 
I'm probably going to... My Switch just went to sleep. Hmm. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So with all that... Mm, no, we need a little car. There we go. With all that said, uh, let's see. They, The Manders do have a lot of curve to them, though. And unlike a lot of the other curve arms, they have wide curve, and they can also cover the front. Not necessarily the best boxing tools, but by far the best curving, curved arms in the game, as they can kind of meet... Straightforward arms, and also, they can meet with curve arms, and they can meet with straight arms. So we're going to put them, let's put them side by side. Right here. Moving on in with the tier list, our next one is going to be the Sparky. So the Sparky, honestly, in the grand scheme of things, it's probably the worst glove in the game. Granted, that's not that's like saying that's like saying Kirby Kirby's Kirby's Adventure is the worst Kirby game in the Kirby series. It's like, yeah, you might there. I'm sure there are reasons why you feel that way. But the Kirby series, that's like, the Kirby's Adventure, even if you felt like it was the worst Kirby game, it's still like miles behind, ahead, or kilometers ahead, of like, so many other games. Even now, even with it being as dated as it is, Kirby's Adventure is so good compared to a lot of other games out there. And the Sparky very much is that. It's a solid arm. It works pretty well. It's not the best glove. But it's probably going to do the job, and it's going to do the job very well, capable of doing some very quick and strong combos. I'm going to be very mean to it, and I'm going to put it as a B tier. By far the lowest tier glove in the game. But still extremely scary. So very scary. Next up on this tier list, as I do want to finish this up quickly so I can get on with some other things in my life. Because it's been two hours. This one's two hours. Granted, I'm not surprised that it took two hours. It's a lot of things to rank. Especially when I'm explaining it all. And like taking my time to explain it. It's not like I'm making a tier list of all the Kirby hats in Smash Brothers Ultimate, where you just look at it and you're like, oh, it's cute! And then you tear it. I love those videos. Anyways. So, the next arm in the tier list is going to be the Thunderbird. Uh, Thunderbird is very similar to the Phoenix, but in the fact that it's a little bit slower, it's a little bit smaller, but the stun that it gives you is so powerful and allows you for allows for so many amazing things. It's not as powerful as it once was, but it's still a very dangerous and effective arm and allows for some very impressive play. We're going to place this guy right there. Ironically, while I say the Sparky is the worst shock or stun arm in the game, it's the best stun arm, or it's the best, or no. While I say the glove is the worst glove in the game, ironically, it's still the best stun arm in the game, apparent if we were to go off of my tier list. Go figure. The next arm in this tier list, though, is going to be the Tri-Blast. Tri-Blast has three-pronged attack, 
while a lot of the others we've talked about Hydra is like this, uh, Triblast is like this. Now it shares similar properties to the Biffler where if you stop one of them while it's charged, the other two go down. But uncharged, if you stop one, these two continue going onwards. Uh, wha what makes the Triblast a very powerful arm is much like the Nade, it has an explosive element to it that allows it to do some amazing, powerful, and dangerous pokes, and generally makes it a very effective tool. Overall, I'm going to put it as a low S tier. Generally pretty safe, pretty effective, very rewarding. The rush sometimes can whiff, but even then it does a lot of shield chip damage on the rush, so you kind of are okay. It's not that bad whenever it messes up. The next arm on this list is going to be the Tribolt, which in the grand scheme of things, in my opinion, while it does have a much safer grab confirm or combo confirm, it's overall going to be a lot less effective than the Tri-Blast for me. The stun is nice. It's still really good. But it's just a, it just doesn't feel as good to use as the Tribal. It doesn't get as many solid results. You're probably going to be rewarded more often for utilizing the Tri-Blast well than the Tribal well. As the Tri-Blast, when used well, also has really solid Blast Confirms. You don't get the grab combos, but who needs them when you're just blowing people up to smithereens? We'll put it as... We'll put it as a B tier. And last but not least, one of my personal favorite arms, but not a good one, the Whammer! So, the Whammer. How it, it works pretty similarly to the Kablammer, except the hitboxes are a little bit better. A little bit. Just a little bit. The stun confirms it does are virtually useless, only allowing you to do rush confirms with your other arm, depending on what that arm is, uh, or attack with that other arm, because there's never a situation where the Whammer is going to recover quick enough for you to follow up with a grab unlike every other stun arm. The Whammer does do a lot of damage when it hits though, and it's a pretty solid anti-air tool. Uh, overall, it's better than the Kablammer, but it's like not that much better. Oh, I'm gonna put it as the bottom of the D tier. I'm sorry to myself, to so many other people. I think it's a, it can be good, but it's also not good. The whammers are so cool yet so bad, but not like the, not even like the power glove. Th that thing at least works sometimes. Well, this works. No, nah, it's the power. They're the power gloves of arms. Alright, so, with all that said, this is the tier list right here. Uh, I'm not going to change too much on this right now, because I'm, really I'm really worn out after talking for two hours straight about arms, and specifically the arms. Uh, I did enjoy it, it was pretty cool. Uh, thank you all for watching on this. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe, the annotation, click the note button. This part is me rambling about YouTube stuff. If you're watching the VOD of, or the stream of this on Twitch, that doesn't directly correlate, but you can subscribe to Twitch or follow on that one as well, because it's cool and it helps the channel out. Yeah, alright. Thank you all for watching. I'm gonna go take a, a quick break. I might do some sparring in arms. Or I might just play Celeste now that I've beaten it and I can actually just enjoy it casually. Or I might do something else, I don't know. Anyways, I'm gonna go to the washroom, I'll be right back.